It's been just over a year since I've had the 350 gallon paludarium set up. Overall, it's been a really good experience, but not all is good. There's been some bad as well. We'll talk about that later on in the video, but I want to show you how it's doing. The most noticeable change, other than more activity in the bottom, is probably what's going on above the room, so I think we'll start there. These plants can't be contained, literally. They've straight up exploded out of the top of the tank, and I love how it looks. This is exactly what I was imagining whenever I first set it up, and it's awesome to see it finally come to fruition. Seeing it then and jumping forward to present day is absolutely insane. I knew it grew in, but I see it every day so it doesn't really register with me. So when I saw this change, I was absolutely mind blown. In line with that, a thing that I can't get enough of is how the plants are not only growing up out of the top of the tank, but they're growing out of the front as well. This makes things look really dynamic, and as you sit here and observe the enclosure, you almost forget that you're looking into a glass box. And that's exactly what I was going for with this paludarium. Another thing that I find really enjoyable is that the peace lilies here have been continuously blooming for several months now. It just adds more interest to the setup as you're looking at it. Another highlight is actually behind the peace lily and that is this rattlesnake plant. I was beginning to think like man it's never going to grow in but I guess it just took a while to get established because in the past two months or so it's really started to put off some new leaves and I love to see it because this is one of my favorite plants of all time. Behind more peace lilies here, we have the moss drip wall. Now the java moss has really taken to the setup quite well, and I love to see how it looks. It's creeped all around the background, and it's just going to continue doing that until all of the area where the water is is covered. Last but certainly not least is the Swiss cheese vine or Monstera dancini. This is a really cool plant, and much like the rattlesnake plant, it took a while to get established and really start working its way around the setup. I can't wait to see as it fills in more of the space though because it just adds a lot of great texture. I can go on and on about the plants, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> They've grown in. The thing that I really enjoy about this setup though are the fish, my buddies. It's just so cool to observe them, to watch them swim around the aquarium. I really enjoy feeding it too. The feeding response is absolutely crazy, and we'll do that later so you can see it for yourself, but I just, man, I can't get enough of it. I especially like to go on the other side of the room and enjoy the tank from afar. Whenever the fish don't know you're watching, they act totally different. As you can tell right now, they're mostly pushed to that side of the tank, but as soon as they get up and walk away, they'll quickly come over into this area and fill in the entirety of the tank, and it's just so awesome to see. Pretty much all of the fish have grown since I've put them in here, and most notably the Congo Tetras. Whenever I put them in, they were super small, and I'd say that most of them now are around 3 inches give or take. For a while there was one that was way bigger than the rest, he just grew super quick, got all that color and the fins and everything, and till now he's still the nicest looking one, but all the other ones started catching up to him, so that's good to see. As I said earlier in the video, there's a lot more activity in here than whenever I first set it up, and that's largely due to the blacktail hemiotis. They're an awesome fish, and I got a really cool and sort of sad story about them. Going back a few months to Aquashell, Chicago, my apprentice and I set up an awesome display tank. While there, we went around to all the local fish stores to try to find the perfect fish for that tank. That's when we found the Hemiotis. So I asked the owner of the store if he'd be able to hold them till Friday, but he said that they only do holds for 24 hours. He assured me though that they'd still be there on Friday because nobody had bought them in ages. So I took his word for it. We go back on Friday and sure enough they're all still there. So I find the manager and I tell him that I want to get some. But there's a catch. I said, you told me they've been here for a while. Can you find out how long exactly? So he goes through and figures it out. It turns out that they had been there since October of 2020 and apparently none of them have sold. So that's October, November. Man, that took me forever to figure out. But they'd been there for 10 months and none of them have sold. As soon as I figured that out, man, my heart sunk and I felt so bad for these poor fish. Why didn't anybody want to buy them? They're awesome. I realized they get kind of big and you need some space, but I just couldn't believe that nobody was trying to get these fish. So I'm like, hey, they've been here for a while. Obviously, they're not selling. Would you strike me a deal if I bought every single one of them? Because they're not that cheap of a fish. I believe they were like 16 bucks a piece, something like that. And he was like, yeah, they've been here forever. I'll definitely do that. So I don't remember how much he took off, but I was able to get all of the fish for a decent deal. And I was just so excited about that because anytime I see something like that, man, it just makes my heart break because nobody wanted these fish. They're awesome. And I've just been enjoying them so much. And I'm glad that I was able to give them a good home. 
Another really awesome thing that happened was with the bronze quarries. If you recall, after I initially stocked this tank, I said that they bred shortly after going in. They laid their eggs all over the front of the glass, but unfortunately the other fish ate them, so nothing ever came to fruition. The same exact thing happened again this year, so I didn't think much of it. That was until I looked in the tank a couple weeks ago, and I was amazed by what I saw. I'm looking in there, and I see all this movement in the leaf litter. I take a closer look, and sure enough, there's all these baby quarries just swimming amongst the leaves. At least 10 of them, and I was just so excited to see it because I never could have imagined they would have survived the onslaught of the other fish. So I guess they hung out in the leaves until they were big enough to free swim, and sure enough, they swim around with all the other quarries now, so it's awesome. Another obvious thing is that you can in fact keep silver dollars in a planted tank. You just gotta put them all above the rim. There's more that I could say about each individual fish, but overall they're just doing so awesome in here. I love to see it, but I actually got some more that we're gonna add in here. So let's take a look. What I've got is a huge skull of Serpa tetras. These were also part of that aqua shell tank. Something really cool about them is that I was actually able to select and catch them myself at the fish wholesaler. So bringing it full circle, I got them back at the animal room here, and I'm going to be able to put them in this tank. They've been in quarantine for a couple of months now, so they're ready to go. I want to get them out of this bucket though, so let's get them in. I should be able to get them with just a few nets, so wish me luck here. Probably about half of them. And most of the other ones, there's about 10 left in there. I'll let them settle in and color up a bit, and then we'll come back and see how they're doing. That didn't take long. They've only been in the tank for about 10 minutes, and they already seem acclimated to their new environment. And that's great to see, and I think it's a testament to how the tank's set up. It's dimly lit, there's a lot of overhead coverage, and I think things like that make the fish feel more comfortable. You may be wondering why I went with these fish. First and foremost is because of the pop of color. Right now they're still kind of orange, but as they're in this tank longer and I feed them different things, they're going to really brighten up and add a nice pop of red to this tank. Another reason was because of their size. Typically you don't see a school of them this large in an aquarium, and I thought that would be a cool thing to showcase. And with that it will really diffuse aggression towards the other fish. These are a notorious fin nipper, and that's usually due to the fact that they're not kept in large enough numbers. With a school like this, they should pretty much just pick on each other and leave all the other fish alone. And finally, I just think they're a beautiful and sort of underrated fish. Now I do have the long fin variety here, which wouldn't be my typical preference. I honestly don't like it on pretty much any fish these days unless that's how they naturally come, but in this instance, the opportunity presented itself where I was able to get these, so I figured I might as well do it. With the addition of those, I'm officially done stocking the tank. Now I'm sure that you could tell that there's quite a few in there, and this tank is a little bit different because I typically wouldn't do that. The thing is though that I have all of this terrestrial growth going on, and with these there's so much nutrient export going on that it's actually very efficiently filtered. Now that begs the question, what exactly goes into maintaining something like this? From my experience at least, paludarium style setups, regardless of the size, tend to be easier to care for as they establish than your average aquarium. And this one is no exception. Believe it or not, it only takes me around 15 to 20 minutes a week to maintain. Here, I'll give you a closer look at what's involved. Occasionally, I'll start out by trimming the plants. Now, this isn't something I do every week. It's pretty much just as needed. If they're growing up into the lights, there's unsightly growth, anything like that, I'll take care of what's needed. I also go around and spray down the foliage. I'm doing this to remove dust and anything else that may have accumulated. Then I go behind the tank and unplug the pumps and power head. At this point I can get my maintenance pumps. For my primary I have a CJ Ultra Zero that I have outfitted with a quick release. This streamlines the process. I can quickly disconnect the hose from my sink, attach it to the pump and drop it into the tank. While the tank's draining I go around with the flipper max to clean off the glass. I got this one because it's strong enough to deal with 3 quarter inch thick glass. It also has a really cool feature here with a blade that you just flip the piece over and it allows you to scrape off stuff like green spot algae with ease. Now for a tank like this that's really tall, it's difficult to get all the way down in there and something like this is invaluable. While the tank's draining, I come down here to the sump area, get my secondary pump, and begin draining the various compartments. This is a good practice because I can remove any waste that may have accumulated. I'll also replace the filter sock if needed. 
By the time I got the first compartment of the sump drain down, it's time to start filling the tank. I had my dechlorinator and filled up with tap water. Back in the sump, I drained the remaining compartments. By the time those are drained out, the water starts overflowing into the sump. That means the level in the tank is correct, so I moved the hose down to the sump and filled up. Eventually I'm able to turn the equipment back on. I'll observe the sump for a little bit to make sure the water level stays consistent, and once it does that means the process is pretty much done. I finish it off with a bag of carbon in the sump and some water clarifier. And after all of that, I gotta go and clean the glass. Because what is that work worth if you can't even see into the tank properly? This is when I tell you about the bad news. The first thing isn't a problem anymore, and as of about a month ago, I finally got it addressed, and that's that I had a mealybug infestation in here. I don't know if you've ever had to deal with them before, but they're really annoying, and getting rid of them over top of a fish tank was a little bit challenging. Now, they didn't come for about three or four months, and I don't think it was from any of the plants that I initially put in here, but I had some house plants down here around that time period, so I think they came from those. So anyway, what I did to get rid of them was trim back a lot of the foliage and periodically spray it down with my pressurized sprayer. This knocked them all down into the water where the fish could then eat them. I'm sure they enjoyed it, but for me it was kind of annoying and I'm sure the tank would look a little bit nicer than it does now had I not had to trim back a lot of the foliage. The other issue is about the Black Coast Knifefish. If you recall last August I bought one, I was super excited about it. They're my all time favorite fish, bucket list fish, and I knew this tank would be perfect for it. When I got it, it was about two and a half inches long and I felt that was too small to put in here so I wanted to grow it out in quarantine for a little while until it was around six inches then I felt comfortable I could put it in here. And I did get it to around that size but unfortunately it passed away in December. Now I don't know exactly what happened but the issue started about a month prior and it was getting like this white film on it. Now I don't know exactly what that was, I assumed it was probably like a fungal infection, that's kind of what it looked like. So I started treating the tank with salt, doing water changes every single day because prior to that I was only doing them once a week. And the issue seemed to go away. So I went back to normal water changes once a week and then it happened again. But this time it just came on in about a day and he passed away. And you know, I don't really like making videos about the animals passing away. I did with MJ obviously and with this I just... I was so distraught about it because obviously it was probably something I did. I don't know exactly, but it was probably something I did. The only thing outside of my care that I could think about is that the municipality's waters typically change around that time, so maybe there was more copper in it for whatever reason, and they're pretty sensitive to copper. So uh, that's the only thing outside of my care that I could think of. But again, it was probably something that I did. And I was just really distraught about it because... I don't know, I, I had a connection with that fish and immediately because they're my favorite and I just felt, I don't know, I felt really bad about it and uh, unfortunately it just didn't work. But there's kind of a silver lining to this story. And that would be my favorite fish in the entire setup, Maxwell. Although he looks similar, Maxwell is actually a brown ghost knife fish. Now I didn't even know these existed until earlier on in the year when my buddy texted me and said dude we have brown ghost knife fish should I get you one and I was really hesitant at first because of what happened previously but I looked into them some and apparently they're easier than black ghost so I'm like you know what I'll give it a try. Whenever I got him he was actually smaller than the other one at around two inches so I had to grow him out for a little bit. I grew him up to three and a half inches or so and then put him into this tank. Six months later and now he's around eight inches long. I don't know where the heck he hides, I don't know where he spends his time, all that I know is that every night whenever I feed, he comes out, goes crazy for food, and then we repeat the process the next day. Again, it's really unfortunate what happened previously, but you know what? I love this fish and I just gotta make the best of a bad situation. And as promised, here's a little bit of feeding footage. It totally changes the entire dynamic of the tank, everybody goes crazy, and I absolutely love it. And I think that's gonna sum up the update. Again, a huge thanks to Custom Aquariums for providing the tank, stand, and sump, Universal Rocks for the awesome background, Seache for the pumps, and Fritz, of course, who sponsors the channel. You saw me use several of their products to maintain the tank. Anyway, that's all I have for you in this one. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about everything down in the comments, and like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Until next time, Surplus Squad, take care and peace.